friends. You bow to no one. Oh, this scene is everything. The memes are so true. I cry every time. Up there for me with all time most powerful scenes, but why? And hi. <laughs> Welcome to the Shire. Something a bit different today. I decided to make this video special because I've been wanting to make it forever since before I even had a YouTube channel. Because it's one of those ideas that's important, and I think Lord of the Rings is one of those stories that's important. There's stories that we enjoy, stories that amuse us, and then there are the stories that really, really matter. matter. There's the stories that really mean something, and Lord of the Rings just means so much to so many people. And it has everything to do with this scene. But not only that, because this scene itself stands at the intersection of three important elements. It stands at the very peak of Aragorn's arc. It's his highest moment, and he gives that over to the Hobbits. Obviously, that also makes it the very peak of the Hobbits arcs as well. But the third element is Hobbits as a concept, as a world-building element. This scene and its corollary in the books, it gets to the very core of why Lord of the Rings, one of the greatest fantasy stories of all time, could only be told with hobbits. Hobbits, by the way, which are one of the weirdest parts of this whole story. And it's something that I think is easy to forget about after we're fans, but what the heck are these things? Who lives like this? Why? And we love hobbits. Hobbits have a whole holiday to themselves called International Hobbit Day, and it's today. <laughs> all these people are here because we all love hobbits. And I'm bringing all of you here to New Zealand, to the Shire, because if you're a gigantic Lord of the Rings fan just like I am, I know you'd also be thrilled to be here and to celebrate with us here because hobbits hold a special place in your heart too. But why? How exactly are hobbits a contributing factor to the story as a whole? To understand why they bow to no one, that is what we need to investigate. What is the idea behind the smallness, the culture, the events of the hobbit plots? We get a whole prologue chapter concerning hobbits before the story even starts. Tolkien is like hell bent on getting us to understand hobbits as like a gateway into his story. He's telling us this is important, but why? And here's a big part of why I'm calling this weird. Tolkien makes a whole fantasy world full of all these magical races, beings, creatures, including hobbits, but then he also makes humans its own race, and then he makes the main character not human. That is an unexpected choice in a vacuum. What is up with that decision? If you look at almost any fantasy or sci-fi story with its own races being species in addition to humans, you just rarely see this. Whether it's Star Wars or Game of Thrones, Wheel of Time, any number of Brandon Sanderson series, not to mention like literally hundreds of alien movies, you just don't see it. And it's understandable why we identify with characters who look like us. And especially when you have non-humans in the same story as humans, we'll naturally gravitate towards the human characters. It's gonna be an awkward setup if you have like the rock people and the humans, and we're supposed to identify with the rocks over the humans. That just doesn't work. And it's not like you never see this arrangement with having both. You'll sometimes see a movie that's all about seeing the world from a different perspective through non-human eyes. Toy Story, not an alien race exactly, but still not human. Movies like Avatar, and even here it's still about a human who becomes alien. And in these cases, and also cases where you have a non-human member of a mostly human cast, you'll see some kind of very pronounced and defined non-human perspective. A moral view that values the opposite of what your average humans may value an all-logic, no-feeling perspective, an immortal perspective. But the weird thing about hobbits is that we don't see that pronounced definitive difference. Hobbits aren't seeing the world differently. It's not about hobbits showing a different non-human way of perceiving things. On the contrary, hobbits feel very human. What does make them distinct in Middle-earth, besides their physicality, is their culture, but that culture is like 200% human. They love a lot of the stuff we love, they do a lot of the stuff we do. The Shire is clearly intended to be this place of familiarity and comfort, and it's very human comfort. So if that's what this is supposed to be, if hobbits are supposed to be human, like our point of reference, our point of human familiarity in so many ways, why not just make them human instead of hobbits? Just call them human. The actual humans are already basically introduced as giants. We're supposed to be hesitant to identify with them. They're big and they're scary and they're unfamiliar. What does the story lose if we just call the hobbits human and call the giants giants? And on the topic of those giants, let's take a quick step back here. Fantasy is usually, classically, the story of the triumph of good over evil. We see that inner battle of the human heart projected onto this grand storyscape, an arc about a hero in the making, facing challenges and triumphing by choosing good, succeeding by embodying these best traits of humanity, rising the world to embrace the grand destiny and lead the forces of good against evil. That is the classic fantasy hero arc, and that does happen for Aragorn. Tolkien makes a whole separate non-Hobbit character for this to happen to. Aragorn is the one with the grand destiny. Aragorn is the hero who pulls the magical sword from the stone, so to speak. He is the leader of the forces of good, and he is the one who, in the end, marries the princess and becomes king and lives happily ever after. That is the classic plot of human triumph, and it happens to our secondary protagonist, if you'd even call him that. And it's our secondary plot, secondary to our main plot, of Hobbit triumph. And Aragorn's plot is not unimportant, no, on the contrary, it's very important, it's heroic, it's a huge part of the story, 
but it's very pointedly and explicitly positioned underneath the Hobbit plot. A diversion. So three questions from this. Number one, why give the big flashy classical hero arc to someone else, someone who's not our main protagonist? Number two, is the story even about the triumph of humanity and human values at all? Or is it about the triumph of Hobbit values over Maya values? What does that have to do with me, the non-Hobbit watching or reading the story? And third, and probably most importantly, Aragorn's arc, this classic story of embracing duty and facing challenges and having the courage to become the leader of all that is good in the world, what could possibly take precedence over that? What arc is there that deserves this number one spot of narrative importance even more so than the classical hero arc? Tolkien is quite clearly saying this classical hero who you know and respect, that hero is second place to this new type of hero I'm making my story about, the Hobbit hero. So who is this Hobbit hero and why does the classical hero bow to him? So I think we gotta explain the smallness first. That seems like the central characteristic of Hobbits. What is up with the smallness? In fact, let's just do this clearly right now. That first question, the general one, if I had to sum up what there is to investigate here, the core characteristics of Hobbits, I would say three things. Hobbits are number one, small, number two, wholesome, and number three, not extraordinary. And yeah, I could say ordinary, I want to say not extraordinary. These are the three chief characteristics, in my opinion, of hobbits that we will need to delve into that will lead us to our precious answers. Smallness first. So I want to show you something that is going to seem kind of random, but it's going to clarify everything here so much. This is from a preview of a competitive gaming documentary. It's about top-level competition, these guys who are trying to become the best in the world. And, probably unintentionally, this little snippet from the beginning of this trailer is by far the best explanation of how the fantasy genre works. Listen to this. This is brilliant. You know when you're a kid, right, you want to be a warrior, you want to be an astronaut, and you want to do battle with dragons or what have you. And it's uh, as an adult now, you know, we live our day-to-day -day lives. I have a career, but at the end of the day, you know, I think deep down we all still kind of want to do that crazy thing we wanted to do as a kid. When I play at my best, I'm Neo from the Matrix. Like I'm just unbeatable, and I'll always believe that. I don't care if I lost the next hundred tournaments in a row. I know that when I play my best, it's, it's a wrap. What this is saying is fascinating to me. Having a triumph in real life in a setting like this, beating a rival in a video game, feels like slaying a dragon. It feels like being the warrior you always wanted to be as a kid. Playing your best, playing at the top of your game, the imagery that fits that most accurately to how we feel is a fantasy character. When we do this kind of mundane thing, if we're being objective, Inside, we are slaying a dragon. We are an invincible, perfect fighter. Fantasy gets a bad rap for being unrealistic because people focus on the surface level of what fantasy is, which is unrealistic, undeniably. But the reason why fantasy fans are so dedicated, so passionate, is because this superficially unrealistic facade is the most realistic, resonant imagery when it comes to reflecting our inner experience. When you have a life-changing epiphany, it feels like pulling a flaming sword out of your soul. When you're in the zone, it feels like you're connecting with the universe. It feels like you can do anything. And when you're afraid, when you're out of your comfort zone and you're fulfilling your responsibilities, but you're out there all alone in a scary, unfamiliar world, you feel small. You feel like you're half the height of the people around you. You feel like your weakness is built into you. Your inferiority is something you cannot ever overcome. You'll never grow beyond their stature. You're not built that way. You are by nature limited. You're by nature weak. The Hobbit experience is our experience. We actually identify with the experience of the Hobbits here more than we would if they were full-sized humans. Because Hobbits use that trick of fantasy, that inner imagery language, to cut straight through the realistic to what's true inside. Hobbits aren't just small. They they make us feel the smallness we feel when we are in the position of these hobbits, when we're embarking on a scary adventure in an unfamiliar world. Okay, so that's puzzle piece number one. Number two, wholesomeness. Hobbits are super wholesome. Their chief pleasures in life are the coziest, comfiest, humblest, most serene, most idyllic features of the human experience. Hobbits are not out at the club, dripped out, going wild, pounding shots, doing coke, getting into fistfights, having orgies. They're not out there hustling, chasing the bag, selling scammy e-courses, pump and dumping crypto, trying to make it big on social media, trying to be the next Kim Kardashian. No, the Hobbit experience is the human experience, but only that one segment, the wholesome, comfy enjoyments in life. That's what Hobbits live for, that is the life they are built for. Now, as much as all this is very compelling in its comfy coziness, we, us in reality, sitting in the audience, the readers of this story, we have a really fractured relationship with this kind of lifestyle. We may daydream about it, but we also dismiss it. We deem it impractical. Because the ones who get ahead in life, the people we admire, 
are the ones who do hustle, who do live in extreme ways, who love the great fight of life, who understand money and power and fame and do whatever it takes to get it. The larger than life figures who dominate our societies, who dominate our history, who dominate our stories, these people of great fiery passion, those are the people who go far, who accomplish great things. Those are the people who may risk becoming villains, yes, but those are the people who become heroes too. Your soft, cuddly, fat man who eats well, who loves a good book, who tends a mean garden, who has spent a lifetime honing his taste to become a pipe tobacco connoisseur, that guy doesn't become a hero. That life, the proclivities and dispositions that come with choosing that lifestyle, they may be pleasant, but they don't take you very far in the grand scheme. They don't enable you to do great things. And we have this ring that preys on greatness, basically. It preys on power and all the passions and ambitions that come with it. And we see its influence on these races who do embody those passions, those extreme ways of life. Dwarves with their uncontrollable obsession with wealth. Men, of course, with their obsession with power. Elves, whose lifestyles embody many different types of extremes. Creativity, perfection, detachment, maybe you'd call it outright haughtiness or ego, but hobbits? Hobbits are not extraordinary and have little capacity for power, little capacity for greatness. So these heroes who bow to no one, who the classical hero and everyone else bows to, and remember we're still trying to explain that, these heroes are afraid of the world. They are physically weak, they're not extraordinary and don't lead extraordinary lives, and they have little capacity for greatness. What is the point of having heroes like this? I think that's what all the other questions are really getting at. What is the point of having heroes who are small, weak, and afraid? And remember, this is limited capacity. That means there isn't room for growth in these qualities. This isn't a young, weak boy who becomes strong, who grows into his greatness. No, hobbits will not ever become strong. Hobbits will not ever become legendary warriors or great kings or anything like that. They will remain not extraordinary. That is a limitation that is built into their race. And it's so unusual in this genre. You think of basically every fantasy hero out there. We usually start out relatively weak and not extraordinary, and then every single one of these characters develops. They transform. They become strong. But no, Tolkien starts us out weak, and then he keeps us there. He wants us there for some reason. He doesn't want us to move on. He's saying, here is where we'll find heroism. Only a wholesome, weak, fearful hobbit is capable of becoming this type of hero. So I think this is the idea. In times of crisis, the most heroic thing we can do is not give in to evil. Nothing should be viewed as a greater accomplishment than just that. The most challenging obstacles, the most difficult crises of our lives don't ask courage from us or strength or wisdom or ability. They just ask for goodness. And that kind of heroism requires a different type of hero. It's not someone big and strong and brave and charismatic. It's not someone wise or someone with great ability. A person who is built to withstand evil will be someone wholesome. It will be someone with a simple life of simple pleasures. Because let's stop and think about what it means to be someone who has courage, someone like Aragorn or Boromir, someone who charges fearlessly into battle. It means you've experienced a lot of darkness in your life. You've felt pain. You've felt loss. You've probably experienced the suffering that comes from not fighting that hard in the past. You've lived through that and you don't ever want to live through it again. That's what enables you to be this strong. You're no stranger to darkness in yourself and darkness in others. It's a normal thing to be fighting to the death, to have others who want to kill you. And it's a normal thing for you to want to kill. And you are no stranger to the kind of unholy rage you need to summon to slaughter your enemies. Granted, for a good cause, but it's so reaching into a dark part of yourself to do great feats like this. If your life experiences have developed you into this kind of strong warrior, a lot of it must have been spent face to face with evil, both in yourself and in others. There's a saying I've heard a lot that fascinates me, both in the truth it holds and in the truth it leaves out. The saying is, hard times create hard men, hard men create easy times, Easy times create weak men, and weak men create hard times. And there's a lot of truth in the statement. We all have people we know, people in our families, who lived through hard times, and that made them strong. And that enabled them to make the lives of their loved ones easier. Or in some cases, maybe it's us, maybe it's you, who's lived through hard times and become strong. It is undoubtedly a true statement. But it's missing a giant chunk of the reality, which is that hard times do create hard men, and sometimes hard men create hard times, sometimes exponentially harder times. It's not that they weren't just as strengthened and empowered through their hard past they were, but that empowerment opens the door for calamity just as much as it opens the door for charity. It's often the same door. Easy times create weak men, Easy times, you see men like hobbits, and I don't think hobbits are the ones creating hard times. In my research for this video, I saw this thing Tolkien said about his time in the war. Gentlemen are rare among the superiors, and even human beings rare indeed. He was looking for humanity, and he was noting that humanity is often the first victim of crisis. He understood the tremendous good in preserving humanity during hard times, and he knew from first-hand experience that there is nothing more heroic than being immersed in evil 
carrying it with you, letting it whisper to you, letting yourself bear the brunt of its powerful influence, and coming out the other side with your duty complete and your goodness intact. The greatest battle is the battle inside the human heart. And the people built to win that battle, to win the battle of the human heart, will not be built like soldiers and armed with swords. They'll be built simple and humble. They'll be armed with a lifetime of good friendships, good food, good books, and good memories. They won't be the ones commanding armies. They'll be the ones who are there to offer a kind word, a favor, to use common sense, to be helpful. Those are the people we should tell stories about. They should be the ones our culture enshrines and myths. In addition to the other heroes, and Tolkien acknowledges both, he shows us the other battles, the actual battle, and he celebrates those heroes of those battles, the hard men who create easy times. He doesn't dismiss that or belittle that this story has those heroes too and we do need those heroes and they deserve all the praise and admiration and fanfare that they get but the lord of the rings is primarily about the battle inside us the battle of the heart the battle for humanity those who fight that battle and those who win that battle those heroes bow to no one I think we have hobbits and humans because that human type of life, the human culture of power and ambition, that's what gets the loudest voice in our world. It feels like the wholesome and the weak and the simple good feels like sometimes that almost doesn't have a place. There's the important people who accomplish things in life, and then there's mediocrity. There's the masses who don't matter, who have no effect on anything. The great people in the world never even pay attention to them. They barely know they exist. That humbler category is one who gets excluded from humanity. That Tolkien quote where the humanity around you is devoid of humanity, that makes you feel like the inhuman one. It's almost like there's something wrong with me. I don't belong with humans, apparently. And that's the journey of this whole story to reintegrate this kind of greatness back into the world of men. It's not a triumph of Hobbit over Maya. It's the triumph of reintroducing humanity back into humanity and the glorious moment when everyone realizes the value of that humanity, of that simple goodness. So, like I said, I've wanted to make this video forever, since way before I started doing YouTube, because I love this idea of heroism so much. Of the millions and billions of people who love fantasy and adventure stories, how many of us become Aragorns? How many of us even have a chance to become an Aragorn? How many have that capacity within them? But how many of us can become the other kind of hero, the Hobbit kind of hero? Almost all of us. And maybe we won't be faced with stakes as high as Frodo with his task, but we can all fight the battle of preserving humanity in dark times, we can all be a good friend, we can all be helpful, we can all do good. Tolkien's heroes represent an ideal we can all attain, an ideal that is too often overlooked, but is actually probably the most important good to strive for. It's a great thing to be strong and brave and ambitious, but there are dangers to having those qualities too. And it's not necessarily a great thing to be weak and small and afraid, not necessarily, but there are types of heroism, types of good that are not just available to the small people of the world. It's not like, oh, even these people can have an impact. No, there are vital and necessary types of good that only small people can do, that big people need small people to do, that the entire world needs small people to do. And this is a story celebrating that kind of good and that kind of hero. That's why I love this idea. That's why I wanted to really make this idea special by bringing you all the way here. And this is not the only idea like that. And it's not the only video like that. I'm here to kick off a special series I've been teasing since hitting 100k a while back. Welcome to Schnee's Middle Earth Tour. I have like three to four big ideas about Lord of the Rings, which if you cannot tell is one of my favorite series of all time, and I have wanted to make videos about these ideas forever. And then I also have some smaller ideas that I'll make into shorts and smaller videos. So that will be the plan in the coming weeks. These will basically be the same kind of analysis videos that I usually make, but on location of the story I'm talking about. Because the world, both Tolkien's world and the real world, is an amazing place and I want to share it with all of you. And it's not going to be exactly as straightforward as it may seem from this description, as you may learn very, very soon. So yeah, subscribe for this beautiful analytical journey through Middle Earth. Support the channel on Patreon. Shoutouts to the new high tier patrons. Kingsley and Sophia, thanks a lot to the both of you. I help people with their writing one-on-one -on -one for that high tier, so look into that if you're interested. And I hope you enjoyed our little trip to the Shire today. Happy International Hobbit Day and thanks for watching.